Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today is the part two of my lecture, which I delivered last week. And that is a continuation of the topic purpura and microvascular occlusion. So I am continuing with the, the dermatosis that results in uh, purpura clinically. This proteinemic purpura and wall uh, and wall Anderson, wall and strong hyperglobulinemic purpura. Clinically, bleeding is usually related to the hyperviscosity syndrome in this case. And the cutaneous features of paraproteinemia include various patterns of vasculitis and neutrophilic dermatosis, retinopathy, and neurological disturbances. Hemorrhagic features are particularly seen. Itch or a burning sensation may occur, and it is likely that this is an immune complex vasculitis. So the basic cause is paraproteinemia, resulting in hyperviscosity that leads to bleeding tendency. Hypergamma globulinemic purpura is usually linked with sarcoidosis, lupus erythematosus, Jogren syndrome, and other autoimmune conditions. Majority of these patients have positive anti-nuclear antibodies and anti-rho or anti-la antibodies. Prolonged walking, standing, or sitting with legs dependent may be the obvious provocative factor. Treatment is not required, although Prednisolone, NSAIDs, and hydroxychloroquine have been used once the purpura sets in. Anaphylactoid purpura and acute hemorrhagic edema. Vessel damage with inflammation may lead to hemorrhage, which typically manifests as palpable purpura. The antigen in the allergic mechanism may be some component of the vessel wall itself or an exogenous substance bound to the blood vessel. Such substances include drugs, bacterial products, and food additives. Two conditions of this type are Hinoxon and purpura and acute hemorrhagic edema in newborn. The latter is now felt to be a variant of Hinoxon and purpura. It may, be, it may be overtly hemorrhagic, but can present as archiform or annular brown lesions. Then disorders of cutaneous microvascular occlusion. This process may involve abnormal coagulation, for example, DIC or antiphospholipid syndrome, or disorders of platelet plugging, for example, heparin necrosis, emboli or crystal deposits, for example, cholesterol emboli, abnormal erythrocytes resulting in microvascular, microvascular occlusion like in sickle cell disease, or abnormal proteins like we see in cryoproteinemias. Many of these conditions may cause purpura as one of their manifestation. So this is a classification of the diseases that cause microvascular occlusion by pathophysiological mechanisms. So if this occlusion occur due to platelet plug, then the causes may be heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or myeloproliferative disorders paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or hemolytic uremic syndrome. So in all the four diseases, the occlusion occurs because of platelet plugs. Then occlusion due to cryogelling. Cryogelling develops in cryoglobulinemias, cryofibrinogenemia, and cold agglutinin-related occlusions. 
then occlusion may also occur because of vessel invasive organisms like ecthyma gangrenosum lucio phenomena vessel invasive fungi and disseminated strongyl id strongyl id ss occlusion may occur because of embolism an embolism can be a cholesterol embolism oxalate crystal embolism atrial myxoma cardiac sterile thrombi septic thrombi or fat embolism occlusion due to systemic coagulopathies protein c or s thrombomodulin pathway abnormalities neonatal purpura fulminans comedin necrosis sepsis related purpura fulminans post infectious purpura fulminans and antiphospholipid syndrome so these all are systemic coagulopathies in which there is increased tendency tendency to develop coagulation occlusion due to vascular coagulopathy so vessel related conditions include snedden syndrome lividoid vasculopathy or atrophy blanchi and malignant atrophic papillosis or degos disease occlusion due to reticulocyte occlusion they include sickle cell disease and other hemolytic anemias occlusion due to unknown or controversial mechanism they include cutaneous calciphylaxis some insect bite reactions like brown recalcitrant spider and some snake bite syndromes so now discussing these disorders one by one occlusion due to platelet flux or the heparin induced thrombocytopenia and heparin necrosis the syndrome of heparin induced thrombocytopenia hit is best explained by heparin reactive antibodies in patient who is receiving heparin when anti heparin antibodies binds with heparin complex on surface of platelets platelet activation and aggregation results so the first step in heparin induced necrosis is formation of a platelet plug and this occurs because of the anti heparin antibodies that bounds to the to heparin which is already uh, which is on already uh, complexed on the surface of platelets and these antibodies bound to the heparin on the platelets results in platelet coagulum so this is the end result of heparin necrosis that is the blisters necrosis and surrounding erythema unfractionated heparin is three times more likely to be associated with hit following an orthopedic surgery compared with low molecular weight heparin patient with hit usually develop absolute or relate relative thrombocytopenia often followed by evidence of venous or arterial thrombosis or of heparin necrosis on the skin low molecular weight heparin is much less likely to cause hit but may be contraindicated in patient with hit due to other type of heparin so other although low molecular weight heparin is safe but if it is given to patient who is already suffering from hit then it may also result in thrombocytopenia and heparin necrosis treatment is by replace replacing heparin with uh, comedin this was previously thought to be effective but comedin substitution are not only ineffective but may in fact induce venous limb gangrene so this is a very careful change the anticoagulants currently used to treat patient with h with hit are denaproids a heparinoid and two thrombin inhibitors um, lepiridin and ergotrabin ergotrabin 
even with treatment with one of these agents, there is a 5 to 20% frequency of new thrombosis. If a patient with history of HIT not receive heparin within 100 days, their antibodies may disappear, allowing them to be treated with heparin again, for example, during cardiac surgery. So once HIT develops, it does not mean that the patient will always develop it again. So later on, uh, unfractionated heparin can be replaced with low molecular weight heparin, and this eventuality may not develop. Then thrombocytosis. Essential thrombocytosis and polycythemia vera, though rare, are first and second most common cause of elevated platelet count with increased frequency of thrombotic events and of erythromelalgia. In addition to the high platelet count, abnormal platelet function occur, occurs in myeloproliferative or myelodysplastic diseases. Erythromelalgia. It occurs as a primary or secondary syndrome. This is intensely uncomfortable burning associated with paroxysm, paroxysmal erythema of the distal extremities. It is frequently triggered by skin contact with a warm surface. Because of platelet origin of occlusion and vascular symptoms in myeloproliferative subset of erythromelalgia, aspirin administration is notably effective in alleviating the symptoms. This is the red discoloration of the feed in erythromelalgia. Low-dose aspirin have been widely accepted as effective thrombosis prophylaxis, although definitive proof is, of its efficacy is lacking. It is much less effective in primary and other secondary forms of uh, erythromelalgia. Enagrelide has become important therapeutic agents acting to both inhibit the platelet activity and decrease the platelet count. Then paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria or PNH is an acquired clonal blood disorder that is associated with deficient hematopoiesis, intravascular hemolysis, and venous thrombosis. The episodic hemoglobin urea is characteristic result of nocturnal hemolysis. Thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or hemolytic uremic syndrome. TDP is a syndrome of thrombocytopenic purpura, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, renal dysfunction, neurological abnormalities, and fever, with a fatal outcome in 90% of the patients. Once plasma exchange pro provide at least some time effective in treating this disorder, criteria for diagnosis were paired to include only thrombocytopenia, and microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. Then occlusion of blood vessels due to cryogenic. Occlusion syndromes triggered by cold exposure are suggested by an acral distribution of the lesions of necrosis or purpura, often with ratiform features and sometimes associated with acral levido reticularis. In addition, the lesions often occur on ear and nose. Cryoglobulinemias. They are classification classified into type 1, 2, and 3 cryoglobulinemias. In 1990, a large proportion of cases was, were found to be associated with hepatitis C. So type 1 cryoglobulinemia, which is a single molecule type, 
monoclonal immunoglobulins, usually IgG or IgMRC. Type 2 or 3 termed as mixed cryoglobulinemias, multiple molecular proteins, typically immune complexes that gel under the laboratory conditions at 2 to 4 degrees centigrade. So type 1 is only single immunoglobulin, type 2 and 3 is mixed cryoglobulin. Patients with connective tissue disease also have higher rates of cryoglobulinemia. In addition to hepatitis C virus, other chronic infections such as Lyme's disease, subacute bacterial endocarditis, Q fever, hepatitis A, B, hantavirus, and HIV have all been reported to induced cryoglobulinemia. The median age of diagnosis of cryoglobulinemia is early to middle age with female to male ratio of two to one. Recurrent showers of dependent palpable purpura, sometimes with burning or itching, frequently associated with arthritis or arthralgia, is a classical presentation of mixed type 2 or type 3 cryoglobulinemias. So this is a typical presentation of uh, leukocytoclastic vasculitis, but it is different from cryoglobulinemia in that in cryoglobulinemia, there are recurrent showers and burning and itching is prominent and arthritis and arthralgia is an associated symptom. Cold induced acrocyanosis of acral areas and non-inflammatory retiform purpura are also more typical of type 1 cryoglobulinemia. Other reported cutaneous findings include acral cyanosis, Raynaud's phenomena, articarial lesions, ulceration, and libido reticularis. Treatment. If symptoms are mild, no treatment is needed. If symptoms of acral lesion if symptoms of acral lesion precipitated by cold, then protection of affected area may be sufficient. Measures to reduce concentration of type 1 cryoglobulin, such as plasmapheresis or cytotoxic therapy, are occasionally effective. For immune complex related diseases, corticosteroids, cytotoxic agents, and plasmapheresis may be effective. Interferon alpha has been used to treat hepatitis C virus associated cryoglobulinemia with or without rebavirin. Cryofibrinogenemias. Cryofibrinogen consists of complex fibrinogen, fibrin, and fibronectin that forms on cold exposure. Plasma rather than serum must be tested to detect these cryogelling proteins. Cryofibrinogenemia may be idiopathic or can be associated with other diseases, which include malignant disorders, especially hemolytic and malignancies, thromboembolytic diseases, IgA nephropathy, and various inflammatory connective tissue or infectious diseases. The most common cutaneous findings are cold intolerance, purpura necrosis, libido reticularis, gangrene, and ulceration. Treatment of cryofibrinogenemia should be aimed at the underlying disease where possible and at protecting areas from cold exposure. Stanozole, an androgenetic, androgenic steroid with fibrinolysis enhancing effect has been used to treat cryofibrinogenemias. Then we'll discuss, discuss a few diseases in which occlusion to the vessels occur because of invasive microorganisms. Ecthyma gangrenosum. It's a cutaneous syndrome characterized by painless, minimally erythematous macules or thin plaques that typically progress to bullous lesions followed by hemorrhage and necrosis. Anogenital area is frequent site of involvement, but lesions can occur anywhere. Patients are almost invariably immunocompromised 
an infectious agent is usually pseudomonas aeruginosa so in this picture you can see the progression of ecthyma gangrenosum from a macule to a plaque then a bullous lesion and then ultimately necrosis prompt recognition of this syndrome is critical since prognosis correlates partially with delay in instituting effective intravenous anti pseudomonal therapy other factors correlating with poor prognosis include multiple lesions and neutropenia other organisms that may cause similar lesion include klebsiella pneumonia e coli staph aureus mucor aspergillus fumigatus and fusariums lucio phenomena or erythema necroticans it's a rare syndrome almost exclusively limited to leprosy patient from mexico and central america it's a type 2 reaction that may be fatal lesions may be recurrent and sometimes cyclic over a period of 2 months to 10 years most often on the legs but occasionally on arm and trunk lesions begin uh, as painful perforic macules or plaques or vesicles that often ulcerate and heal with atrophic scars so this is a vascular uh, uh, this is a vasculitic reaction immune complex resulting in uh, in patient of lepromatous leprosy resulting in several plaques of cutaneous necrosis lucio phenomenon his logical findings include leukocytoclastic vasculitis with aggregates of bacilli within the proliferating endothelial cells treatment is clue include standard multi drug treatment for lepromatous leprosy and attention attention to fluid and electrolyte balance prednisolone thalidomide and clofazamine may all be required to control the reaction as we do in type 2 lepra reactions response to treatment is often reported to be poor with severe morbidity and frequent death the number of reported cases are small then vessel invasive fungi fungi may cause overwhelming infection in immunocompromised patient both aspergillus and mucor are the two commonly reported fungal groups that cause vessel invasive lesions primary lesion typically occur at intravenous infection site organism in the lesions appear as septate hyphae with acute angle branching invading blood vessels and surrounding tissue often with minimal inflammation lesions may either be primary or secondary to disseminated disease and including include ulcerating gangrenous lesion perforic nodules and necrotic ulcers response to therapy of these type of infection is relatively refractory disseminated strongolite dios dss strongolite stercoralis is a nematode responsible for human parasitic infection that is known as strongolite dss filiform larvae from contaminated soil penetrate the skin simple infection include papule or erythematous serpiginous tract then that extend several centimeters larva migrants in immunocompromised patients dissemination of organism can occur resulting in petechiae purpura and reticulate purpuric skin lesions treatment is oral thiobendazole uh, and may need to be prolonged in immunocompromised patients then we'll discuss conditions that results in emboli cholesterol embolus the most commonly diagnosed cutaneous embolic syndrome occurs secondary to fragmentation of atherosclerotic plaques known trigger include angiography angioplasty vascular surgery and cardiopulmonary resuscitation the classical clinical triad comprises of leg or foot pain levido reticularis with good peripheral pulses treatment of cholesterol emboli involves statin 
Iloprost, which is a prostacyclin, prostacyclin analog, pentoxyphylene, and steroids, which are reported to have a limited success. Embolism can be from cardiac source, like atrial myxomas and septic endocarditis. Symptoms may partly mimic those of infectious endocarditis, connective tissue disease, vasculitis, or rheumatic fever. Cutaneous findings of myxomatous emboli include levido reticularis, splinter hemorrhages, Raynaud's phenomena, serpiginous or annular purpuric lesions on the fingertip. Protein C and S related diseases that also include neonatal purpuric fulminance or homozygous protein C or protein S deficiency. Patients who are heterozygous for deficiency may develop repeated venous thrombosis or pulmonary emboli in early adult life. Homozygous deficiency is associated with neonatal purpura fulminance. Retiform or stellate purpura and necrosis is the most typical cutaneous finding that result from thrombosis within cutaneous microvasculature. Skin lesions develop typically within a few hours to five days after birth and most commonly distributed over the extremities. Findings are consistent with DIC and evidence of consumption of clotting factors prolonged PTT or clot lysis, elevated fibrin split products, and often thrombocytopenia. Traditional treatment include FFPs, more recently protein C and activated protein C concentrates have been used for treatment of both acute disease and prophylaxis. Cumarin or warfarin necrosis, which is severe acquired protein C dysfunction. Cumarin necrosis usually present as sudden onset of pain within three to five days of beginning of cumarin therapy. It is followed by well demarcated erythema, progressing to hemorrhage, necrosis, and often hemorrhagic bulla or a scar. The risk of cumarin necrosis is increased if loading dose of 10 milligram of more or warfarin is used. The therapeutic effect of cumarin is due to inhibition of alpha carboxylation of vitamin K dependent coagulant factor like factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. This is picture of blissbulla and later on necrosis due to cumarin or warfarin. Sepsis related purpura fulminance. Bland retiform purpura with DIC or acquired protein C deficiency. The term purpura fulminance has subsequently been used for widespread cutaneous hemorrhage in patients with sepsis, including infection with Neisseria meningitis, Staph aureus, beta hemolytic streptococci, streptococcus pneumoniae, Hemophilus infancy, and Hemophilus aegypticus. However, hemorrhage in patients with DIC may be due to septic vasculitis, simple bleeding, or microvascular thrombosis. So there are other causes as well. Purpura that is associated with infection. Purpuric skin lesions associated with infection may be due to numerous mechanisms, more than one of which can be operate, may be operative, including thrombocytopenia, localized or disseminated intravascular coagulation, direct vascular damage, invasion or occlusion by the organisms, vascular toxic effects by the toxins, immunological vascular injury like vasculitis and emboli. Antiphospholipids antibody or anti, uh, lupus anticoagulant syndrome. APLS occur in association with SLE and other connective tissue diseases. Mean age is 42 plus minus 14 years. Antibodies detected today are lupus anticoagulants or antiphospholipid antibodies. 
Lupus anticoagulant activity is detected often incidentally by prolonged PTT. While this would seem to predict a tendency towards bleeding, individuals are paradoxically predisposed to clot formation. Causes of this paradox. Multiple pathways have been implicated by which these antibodies promote thrombosis. That is promotion of procoagulant reactions, interference with anticoagulant pathways, and interference with prostacycline production. So these paradox results in clot formation rather than bleeding. So this is a uh, lividoid uh, or libido reticularis like lesions on the skin. International consensus preliminary criteria of antiphospholipid syndrome. Definitive diagnosis require at least one clinical and one laboratory criteria. So the clinical criteria are four. The first is of vascular thrombosis, where there is one or more clinical episodes of arterial, venous, or small vessel thrombosis. Then complication of pregnancy have three criteria. One or more unexplained death of a normal fetus at or after 10 weeks of pregnancy. One or more premature birth or morphologically normal neonate at or before 34 weeks of gest gestation. Three or more unexplained consecutive spontaneous abortions before 10 weeks of gestation. So any of the three uh, pregnancy features fulfills one clinical criteria. Then laboratory criteria are two. Anti-cardiolipin antibodies at a moderate or high level on two or more occasions at least six weeks apart. Or lupus anticoagulant antibodies on two or more occasions at least six weeks apart. Treatment. For now, treatment is empirical. Antiplatelet therapy is of uncertain benefit. Most therapy depends on acute and often chronic anticoagulation, either with standard or low molecular weight heparin initially followed by initially followed by cumarin. Occlusion due to vascular coagulopathies or Snedden syndrome. This syndrome comprises of generalized libido reticularis with focal neurological symptoms or signs. Several authors require the presence of anti-nuclear antibody or antiphospholipid antibody, but others would only accept the diagnosis if these antibodies are absent. In addition to the cutaneous libido, there may be non-specific neurological prodromal symptoms such as headache, migraine, dizziness, and vertigo. Later, the neurological features include focal paresis or hemiparesis, focal sensory or hemisensory symptoms, fits, visual defects, and later cognitive changes. So positive antiphospholipid antibodies are uh, more commonly have infarcts in the distribution of main cerebral artery on MRI. Treatment. There is generally no very effective treatment. Corticosteroids have some benefit, but this is variable and often difficult to assess. Other immunosuppressive agents are disappointing. Avoidance of smoking and oral contraceptives and treatment of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Thrombolytic agents and vasodilators have been used in acute situation. Antiplatelet agents appear to be effective in longer term. Levidoid vasculopathy or atrophy blanch. This syndrome is most common in young to middle-aged women most commonly noted association is with chronic venous hypertension or varicosities. So can be seen in male, 
but commoner in female. Most characteristic histological findings are some thickening or highlying changes <coughs> in walls of superficial dermal vessels and luminal fibrin deposits. Persistent, very painful, and often punched out ulceration occur on the legs, especially around the malleoli. When accompanied by surrounding levido reticularis, the term levidoid vasculitis is more likely applied. So there is a background of levidoid changes, and you can see uh, scarring and a healing ulcer. Retiform or stellate purpura or ulcer extension can occur. Healing result in porcelain white scars frequently surrounded by telangiectasia. You can see this scarring with telangiectasia and scars are stellate or pointed or in a net-like pattern, retiform. Treatment is by antiplatelets, anticoagulant, and fibrinolytic, as well as anabolic steroids, such as danazole or stanazole. Puva therapy have been reported as effective in some cases. Malignant atrophic papillosis or Degos disease. It's a progressive vasculopathy causing occlusion of small and medium-sized arteries characterized by skin and GI lesions. Pathogenesis probably involves abnormal coagulation, platelet and fibrin thrombi, endermis, mesenteric, and nervous system blood vessels. Early skin lesions are pink or red, doom-shaped papules, two to five millimeter, but sometimes up to 15 millimeter in diameter. Papules, soon become necrotic and umbilicated with a central porcelain white pallor and scaling and pink edematous border that becomes telangiectatic. Most heal rather slowly to leave small white scar. Similar lesion may occur in many organs. Gastrointestinal lesions are the most important as perforation of gut is a cause of death in this case. You can see multiple porcelain white atrophic papules with surrounding erythema. There is no consistently effective treatment. Steroids do not help, although some benefit in neurological symptoms is suggested. Aspirin, antiplatelet agents, and fibrinolytic agents and pentoxyphylline alone or in combination may lead to remission and perhaps most effective in cutaneous disease. Surgery to treat intestinal perforation may resolve the acute situation, but is difficult as there are usually multiple lesions. Cutaneous calcifylexis. It is rare but increasingly frequent complication of renal failure and dialysis. Patients are usually obese, obese middle-aged women. Early lesions tend to present as painful plaques, often with retiform or stellate pattern, and may show central necrosis. Woody induration with extending ulcer typically follows. So this is a progression in patient of calcifylexis, starting from erythema, then cutaneous necrosis, ulceration, Cutaneous necrosis and then finally ulceration. Both vascular and extravascular calcification occur. Mechanism of this syndrome is unclear as is the role of parathyroid hormone and calcium and phosphorus. Prognosis is generally considered poor with mortality of 50 to 80 percent, though occasional reports of more benign course exist. Specific clinical presentations, the levido. Levido describes a reticulate pattern of slow blood flow and bluish discoloration of a skin, which should be completely blanchable. Levido is divided into two patterns, levido reticularis and levido racemosa. Levido reticularis tend to develop a tight net-like pattern 
often symmetrically distributed on both feet. Cutis marmorata in infancy is a perfect example of levido reticularis. While levido racemosa typically has breaks in the tight net-like pattern, that is, there is an irregular net-like pattern resulting in large irregular rings than levido reticularis. And it is seldom symmetrical and it's indicative of focal impairment of blood flow. So this is levido reticularis, in which the very tight net-like pattern is seen, while on the other hand, levido racemosa, the net-like pattern is also appreciable, but it is not as clear as in levido reticularis. There are a lot of acquired causes of levido reticularis that are non-physiological, where they include the vascular diseases like polyarthritis nodosa, rheumatoid vasculitis, mixed cryoglobulinemia, Sneddon syndrome, levidoid vasculitis, and arteriosclerosis. Rheumatoid diseases include lupus erythematosus, dermatomyositis, scleroderma, and Joggenen syndrome. Then increased blood viscosity like polycythemia rubra vera, thrombocytosis, cryoglobulinemia, cryofibrinogenemias embolic and hypercoagulable disorders, cholesterol emboli, oxalate, sickle cell disease, and nitrogen bubble embolization, antiphospholipid syndrome. So uh, we have all discussed all these diseases before. Infections lead to secondary emboli, for example, endocarditis or purpura fulminans related to occlusion, syphilis, tuberculosis, and viral infections. Nutritional causes include pellagra, endocrine hyperparathyroidism, pseudo-hyperparathyroidism, hypothyroidism, Cushing's disease, carcinoid syndrome, iatrogenic, bismuth intra-arterial catecholamine, amantadine, cunidine, cutaneous necrosis. So there are many causes of cutaneous necrosis and it can be coagulation defects like purpura fulminans, DIC and protein CS deficiency, vasculitis like polyarthritis nodosa, Bichert's, Wagner, Chug straw, Sinox Shonlin, connective tissue disorders, antiphospholipid syndrome, dermatomyositis, relapsing polychondritis, SLE, systemic sclerosis, immunological mechanisms of cutaneous necrosis, Schwarzman reaction, hyperviscosity, cryoglobulinemia, cryofibrinogenemias, embolic causes, metabolic causes like diabetes, calciphylaxis, arterial occlusion, infections like uh, necrotizing fasciitis, cellulitis, meningococcal pseudomonas, lucio reaction, viral and fungal and snake venoms. Drugs and toxins. Several drugs can cause cutaneous necrosis like anticoagulants, vasopressin, chemotherapeutic drugs like methotrexates, antimicrobials, antithyroid drugs, carbon monoxide poisoning, topical like glutaraldehyde, uh, citromide, calcium chloride, mustard gas, injections sites, calcium salts, interferon, Aminoglycosides, collagen, silicon, all result in cutaneous necrosis. Malignant conditions, blood disorders, leukemia, lymphoma, mycosis fungoides, lymphomatoid granulomatosis, <coughs> hyperusinophilic syndrome, myeloid dysplastic syndrome, Langerhans cell histocytosis, physical damage like burn, radiation, trauma, inflammatory dermatosis. So there's a long list, which inflammatory dermatosis includes sarcoidosis, PL, pleva, pyoderma ganginosum, other neutrophilic dermatosis, and intrauterine epidermal necrosis. Causes of neonatal purpura include deficiency of clotting factors and coagulation disorders that include purpura fulminans and vitamin K deficiency. Thrombocytopenias can be congenital, maternal, antibody-related. Extramedullary erythropoiesis, like in blue uh, berry muffin babies, and torch infections, Toxoplasmosis, rubella, cytomegalo, herpes may cause blueberry muffin lesions. And other infections include HIV and parvovirus B19 and sepsis. Congenital and inherited disorders include Westcott Eldridge syndrome. Maternal antibody mediated, uh, mediated reaction include ITP, SLE, associated with hemangiomas, big hemangiomas, traumatic like caput, secudanum, and facial fatigue. Others include vascular purpura and non-accidental injury. Causes of purpura fulminans in neonate. Acute infections, post-infectious, congenital protein, CNS deficiency, 
acquired protein C and S deficiency by cumarin, hepa um, hepatic cholestasis, nephrotic syndrome, antiphospholipid syndrome, may be associated with SLE, vasculitis, like polyarthritis nervosa in oxonal purpura, heparin induced necrosis, toxin, and poisons. The use of term purpura fulminance as a broad term for widespread cutaneous purpura of any type is probably more confusing than helpful. So it is more helpful to restrict the term purpura fulminance to disorders in which cutaneous microvascular occlusion is the known cause of widespread cutaneous purpura. So this uh, then contact purpura. Purpura may occur as an irritant reaction to mechanical friction from abrasive agents such as woolen clothing or fiberglass. Some topical medications may rarely cause purpura that appear to be irritant or toxic causation such as clioquinol, benzo benzoyl peroxide or EMLA. This is a contact purpura due to shoes. There are a lot of group of chemicals that are associated with contact purpura. They include dyes and textile agents like azodyes, paraphenyl diamine, and optical whiteners, rubber antioxidants, resins, plants, and other topical medications like balsam of Peru and mud. So this ends with um, this lecture. And I hope the topic is uh, more clear to you now. There was um, a long list of disorders that results in different uh, cutaneous manifestations. You don't need to remember all, but it is good to remember the important uh, disorders that lead to various forms of uh, purpura, hemorrhage, and necrosis. Thank you all for the patient listening and hope to see you next time with another edition of my lecture. Goodbye and have a good day.